Okay. So, uh, hello. Uh, my name is v Dr. Vuk Vukovic. Um, I have um, uh, I'm, I'm a co-founder and uh, CEO of Oracle Intelligence Systems. It's a British company, and we're a data science company that builds prediction models. And one of the things that we've built is a prediction model that helped predict both Brexit and Trump back in 2016. And now we're using it mostly for commercial purposes. I also ha have a PhD in political economy from the University of Oxford. Uh, and the Master of Science uh, from the London School of Economics. And I'm very happy to um, speak at your, at your conference today regarding um, a topic that's going to be um, slightly controversial, but related to the, to the COVID crisis. Thank you once again for inviting me. Um, so what we basically do, as I said, we build prediction models. So um, we're kind of, and at this point, most of our attention during the corona pandemic has been on uncovering uh, sentiment of people. So the levels of fear, of uncertainty, and how people are reacting, how they're changing their behavior with respect to, to what's happening around them. Uh, <clears throat> so one part of that was to develop something that we call the fear uh, reaction index. Uh, so it's, a, it's, it's, it's an index that meant that's combining several economic indicators, such as consumer confidence or business confidence, unemployment, unemployment expectations, etc. And we're combining this with our own survey uh, information, which we took from all uh, 28 EU countries, and we're looking at basically uh, how people in each country are reacting with respect to the coronavirus, how this is changing and affecting their preferences, and what's, what's, what's basically happening. And, and this is going to tell us um, what will be a kind of the reaction of everyone in case there is a second wave, which is the title of this, of this presentation. So we need to understand how people are going to react, how they're going to adapt in this whole post uh, first phase COVID, and then what happens if there is a second wave? We hope there, there won't be, but what if it is? How the people are very, how the people are likely to react, and how this is going to affect um, the economic situation, in, in particular, aggregate uh, demand of, of consumers, and how this is going to affect um, uh, uh, GDP in the end, and, and whether or not we're going to have a deeper recession or a smaller recession. So anyway, so we did this, this index that I mentioned, the, the fear index, we're calling it the FRIX. Uh, and what we've estimated is that the levels of fear and uncertainty are still, even for, for, for June, at an all-time high in the markets in the EU uh, and in the UK, especially when compared to, to the previous peak that we had in March uh, 2009. Um, now, business and consumer sentiment, they're also at 10-year lows. Policy uncertainty is at an all-time high as well, and especially the market is expecting unemployment to, to, to soar across the EU in the coming months, which is, which is not a good sign. Um, but, so the thing is that people are basically cutting down their major purchases. Um, they're going to go down by 42% this year, and over 70% of people expect a recession, um, that the recession is imminent this year, and their main reaction from this is to postpone all spending decisions. So basically, yeah, people are, are cutting down major purchases this year by, by 40%, and, and over 70% of them are certain that a recession is imminent, and therefore they're postponing their major spending decisions. Um, now, we've captured this, as I said, in an indicator. I want to I share to you um, what this looks like, essentially, just so you can get an idea. Uh, so, so here is... I'm sorry. Okay. So I hope you can see the index right now. So this is the fear reaction index for June. And you can see that its um, peak level in June 2020 is even higher than the previous peak of during the crisis of 2009. So what, what we're measuring here is a com combination of several factors. One is uh, consumer and business confidence across the EU. Uh, and then we have unemployment expectations, policy uncertainty, and then we have our own surveys uh, where we ask people and we see basically what they um, what they think is going to happen and how they predict how they make their predictions um, about about the up what are their expectations and so on and this is kind of one part of our approach is to offer these um, these predictive it's, it's what we call basically predictive polling where we ask people not just what you think is happening or what you what you want to do but what you know how things are going to look like in the in the years in the years to come. Um, in addition to uh, to this, we're we're also looking at um, so that's the first part. Um, I can now stop this for, for a moment uh, so that you can have your attention back back on me. Um, so this is the first part of of, uh, of what we do, and then we're we're trying to basically figure out um, uh, the people's individual preferences. So, for example, 
But with respect to, to the index that I showed you, um, we saw that about two thirds of the population across the EU will change their behavior in the coming months, basically until the vaccine is discovered. So they're going to avoid large crowds. They're going to keep maintaining physical distancing. Uh, they're going to go to their favorite places, so restaurants, theaters, whatever, except just less frequently than, than before. And they're going to cut down travel, uh, especially air travel, significantly. Now, all this is going to depress demand in the economy. And so we can basically see something like this occurring occurring right now, which is what, what the fear index that I just showed you is sort of a forward-looking indicator telling us what's what's about to happen now in addition to the to the fear in, the, in addition to all these economic and, and and people preferences we're also looking at um uh, epidemiological data so we did some own predictions let me show you another another screen of, of something that we've um that we've done um so if you can see this this is sorry okay so if you can see this this is our um approximation of daily deaths across certain selected countries um, so you can see, so, so these are some, some selected countries in Europe, uh, the bigger ones, including both um, uh, the United States and uh, um, Canada. Uh, and we were really accurate in predicting and estimating the total debt numbers for all these countries. The United States, for example, we saw that this is a logarithmic scale, but we saw that this, this was done back in May. Uh, by now, we already have an accurate prediction of uh, over 100,000 deaths in the US, about close to 40,000 deaths in the UK, et cetera. Um, now, but even more interesting than this is something else that I want to show you is the reaction that the people had during the, the whole, during the whole uh, pandemic. You, if you can see this graph, um, these are days uh, of measuring mobility drop. So we, we took Google's mobility data so how people it's because google can through your phone access where you're where you're moving and how you're uh, where you're going how you're traveling and we took it for this is for all 28 european countries including the us and canada so there's 30 countries here and you can see that every single country had a significant drop in mobility regardless of how their governments react to the crisis so for example you have sweden there and sweden had a decline between 40 and 50 percent so people simply stayed home despite the fact that the government didn't tell them, all right, you should stay home and you should limit your uh, travel and whatever. Other countries like Italy, for example, they have nine, close to 90% decline in mobility, but all the countries are basically somewhere, somewhere around here. Now, based on this information, we can measure whether or not th these these measures that the people undertook either as, as a part of the government telling them what to do or as a part of their own decision significantly decreased uh, uh, debt rates, and we can see this in the next graph. Okay, so this is the doubling time of debts from from COVID nineteen, and we can see basically for all of these same countries that I just shown you, you can see that there the, the number of um, um, so this is doubling time of debts. So so for example, before the um, before the the mobility measures or restrictions were being implemented, it took two days. Uh, in some countries, or three or four, for the for the number of cases to double, right? After the imposition of the, uh, the the imposition of these restriction measures, both self-imposed and or imposed by the government, you can see that in every country these rates decline significantly, right? So that's why we had a decline in um, in new cases. Uh, I did, we did the same thing for the U.S. This is even more uniform, which is very interesting. So mobility declines significant, so up to between uh, you know 40 and 60 percent on average for all states. Again, regardless of how the state reacted, mobility went down. So people basically, uh, even if the state didn't tell them to limit their mobility, they did it on their own. Right? They stayed home and they behaved in a way of respecting social mobility, uh, social mobility measures. Okay. So now um, let me just. Uh, okay, I wanted to share one more thing. Right, uh, this is the same same thing for the for the doubling down of of, of debt. Okay, so um, uh, just uh, uh, I'm sorry, stop share. Okay, now you can you can focus on me again. All right, so this was the idea of of trying to figure out um, how everyone responded during the pandemic, right? And this gives us a good indication of what's going to happen again. So in case the second wave does happen. We're hoping that it doesn't, but in case it resurfaces again in Europe, because what we're seeing right now, we're looking at countries uh, south of the uh, in the southern hemisphere, hemisphere, uh, so uh, South America, like Brazil or African countries, or even Southeast Asia. The virus is um, basically growing strongly in those countries. So if travel is again reestablished, it's only going to be a matter of time before it goes back 
goes back into the Western Hemisphere. There's already been talks this week about uh, about the virus reappearing in the United States, um, about the second wave reemerging in the United States. So we're going to see. Um, um, uh, we're expecting a very turbulent uh, fall and winter by the end of this year. So if, in case this does happen. Uh, the mobility data that I just shown you is going to give us a good indication of how the people might react, right? So despite what your governments tell you, if people decide, all right, I'm not going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to stay home because the virus is again spiraling out of control. Maybe the governments won't impose the same restriction measures as they have been imposing uh, before, but the people will certainly have this reaction, and we can see this in the survey data, and we can see this in the actual data of of mobility. Uh, during the during the first wave of the pandemic, so a uh, kind of a lesson for this is that um, basically, if this new wave should should to some extent emerge, regardless of what the government decide, we can again anticipate that the people will stay home and limit this mobility, limit social exposure, and this will once again trigger a slowdown in demand. Another issue that we have here is that if there is any um, um, second wave occurring, or even if it isn't. At this point, we have a lot of people in, in, in every country whose jobs are basically being jeopardized. Um, so, for example, um, in Croatia, where I come from, there's about half a million jobs. We, we're a small country, much small, uh, half the size of Hungary, even less, we're four million. Um, and so we basically, um, only about 1. or 1.5 million people work. And out of that, half a million jobs are in danger because of the pandemic, because of the first effect of the pandemic, because of the lockdowns and the shutdowns and everything that that, that, that happened, that we remember happened. Um, so in this particular case, this is a lot of jobs. This is basically one third of the workforce that's being endangered right now in terms of they don't know whether or not they're going to keep their jobs by the end of the year. In other countries, this is also, uh, the numbers are similar. We, we saw the United States where there's already 40, over 40 million people who are uh, searching unemployment claims, which mean, meaning that they lost basically their jobs, uh, either temporarily or permanently, we, 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 that remains to be seen. But the problem is when you have a lot of people whose jobs are being endangered, they're not going to go out and spend. Right? They're not going to go out and buy a new car or buy a new house or whatever. Uh, they're going to basically save money, which is obviously affecting aggregate spending, which is, again, affecting aggregate demand and, and the GDP growth. Um, so, so this is already being, this is already exacerbated because of the first wave. If the second wave happens, we can expect another significant decline in demand, which is basically, um, which is going to be translated into uh, um, even more policy uncertainty and even greater fear in the economy. Now, I don't want to be too uh, too negative or too uh, depressing for, for this for this presentation. So basically, what we um, have to think about at this point, in terms on the company level and both on the government level, is how to respond to this. Right. So at this point, if we know that what we're that we're looking forward to an event that can be as disruptive as the first wave, okay. If we know that we already have negative economic consequences from the first wave of the pandemic, and then we, we we're, we're anticipating the same situation to happen in um, three six months time, whatever, then we need to you know have a contingency plan right now. What to do? A risk management strategy right now. In, in what to do in case the second wave does emerge and further depresses demand from what it already is. Now, from an individual company level, we can discuss this. A sound manager would impose such a, a, a risk management strategy that would be a sort of a hedging strategy from, uh, for his, his or her company from the potential shocks. So how, do, how does this look like? Um, so if you're expecting a market decline, you can, you can buy hedging instruments on the financial markets. So in, in the case that if the market does go decline, you're buying uh, an instrument that, that where you can benefit from the decline and therefore um, kind of override the, 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 the full extent of the decline. This is the same thing for investors, right? It's the same piece of advice. So buying things like put options or insurance policies, any, any kind of insurance policy that will help you um, um, go through an event uh, of this magnitude if it happens again. And for governments, the government should basically um, try to refrain from imposing, again, lo lockdowns. Um, but, however, in any case, if there is, as, as we said, as we mentioned a couple of times during this presentation, if there is a potential um, reemergence of the virus in, in Western Europe and in the United States, people will limit their mobility regardless, right? So we're, again, going to have 
restaurants with problems and, and hotels and, and event industry and whoever, all these industries that are very, very airlines, for example, all these industries that are very sensitive to the decline. So managers from these companies should already prepare a strategy what ca- what, what to do in case, uh, in case this does happen. So we should already have a plan for this. Uh, and governments basically should start thinking about um, not imposing such strict measures, but basically uh, making sure that there is still enough firepower with both from both the central bank side and from both the fiscal policy side to help uh, the ailing economies in case this, this does happen again. Now, there, this is going to be a problem since we already, our first response to the crisis has already been a significant fiscal stimulus on one hand and a significant monetary stimulus on the other hand, whether it's from the ECB in Europe or, or the Fed in the United States and every individual government, obviously, as well. Um, so it's a question of fiscal sustainability in, in the next year and the years uh, 2021, 22, etc. So how, how is this debt that we issue right now going to be financed? Now that is going to be a, that is going to be a painful question um, for next year, um, but we'll deal with that basically when it, when it happens. At this point, we need to think about helping the economy survive, right? Um, the, the reason why the, the economic measures of most governments have been successful during the first the first wave of the pandemic was because they were they were swift they were broad and they were significant they were large right because at this point it's it's think of it similarly to to uh, to the pandemic itself so you needed to so called level the curve that's that's what everyone was talking about the leveling of the curve means that you simply have to make sure that there's not not too many patients with respect to the number of hospital beds that you have. It's the same thing with the economy. You cannot allow to have so much unemployment, unemployment rise um, um, so high and have such a huge number of firms failing uh, in order to help the economy, in order to prevent the economy from, from basically collapsing, right? Because when you have a lot of unemployment, a significant surge in unemployment, this is going to have a huge negative effect on aggregate demand, and the economy is always reacting with a time lag. Right? So if a lot of people lose their jobs right now, if you, if you say, let's you know, take the example of Croatia, one third of the workforce loses their jobs, there's going to be a year before they can find new, they can reallocate to new jobs because the economy reacts with a time lag. Economists like to say that the economy is often sticky, right? prices are sticky, wages are sticky, which means that it takes time for them to react, to adapt. And the same thing is going to happen, happen here. Um, with that, I'm gonna. I, I want to leave you leave you on a positive note. I think there that there is a way of um, um, a lot of companies have adapted positively to the to the pandemic. Um, there is talk of the new normal where everything is happening online, including, for example, this this presentation. Uh, so everything's happening online. Uh, a lot of companies are looking at digitalization strategies. The government is looking at digitalization strategies, uh, in investing a lot of money into this, which is always good. So. There is, a, there is a high chance that in 2021, we are going to have an economic recovery and we're going to go, um, uh, things are going to end up better for us in the long run because the pandemic is going to basically change the, the, the old, some of the old ways of doing business and doing things in government and whatever. And this is going to prepare us for um, um, an online future, which is, which is always good. Um, but we have to brace ourselves and, and ride all of these waves, so how many of these waves we're going to have. Uh, and once we do that, we're going to have a, a bright future. Okay, thank you very much.